On January 31st, 1939, in Webster, South Dakota, Jerome, or Jerry, Brudos was born. Right from the jump, Jerry's mother, Eileen, made it abundantly clear that she did not want to have another boy. His mom was very verbally and physically abusive towards him. She took most of her resentment and frustrations out on him. The Brudos family moved around quite a bit, and home life was pretty unstable. Jerry didn't want to stay at home with his mother, who hated him, so he would play by himself outside and wander around. One time, Jerry was walking around and stumbled across a junkyard. In this junkyard, he found something fascinating to him. A pair of high heels, open-toed stilettos to be exact. So Jerry took the shoes back home with him. He wore them around the house, in his room, just really feeling the fantasy. Unfortunately, Jerry's mother found him while he was trying them on. She was horrified. She went on a tirade grabbed the shoes and threw them away. Jerry still wanted the shoes, so he grabbed them from the trash and hid them in his room to play alone. Once again, Eileen found Jerry with the heels, and this time she was enraged. She took the shoes and lit them on fire. When Jerry was in first grade, his family packed up and moved to California. Jerry's new teacher always wore high heels and kept an extra pair in the classroom. This was incredibly tempting to Jerry, who attempted to steal the extra pair of shoes. One of Jerry's classmates saw him going for the heels and called him out. Jerry admitted to his attempted theft, and the teacher got super mad at him. She embarrassed him in front of the entire class, and he left the room. The Brudos' new neighbors had several teenage daughters. Jerry would often sneak over with their little brother and look through their drawers and closets. This is where he developed a new fascination for women's underwear on top of high heels. Jerry went through puberty and started to develop curiosity about his body and bodies that were not like his own. This should not be a shameful time. However, Jerry's mom made it one. She forced him to hand wash his bed sheets when there were stains, almost demonizing him for growing up and having sexual desires. However, Jerry's urges became very scary and would soon turn violent. Jerry began stalking his female neighbors and would look through their windows. He would go through their laundry hanging up on a clothesline and steal their underwear. This happened multiple times, and it got so bad that the police were called to investigate the situation. Jerry caught wind that the cops were trying to find the thief and used this to his advantage. He showed up at the house, imitating a police officer, and asked the girl more questions about the underwear theft. He asked for her to come over to his house so he could ask questions there. She complied and said she would be right over. The girl arrived at Jerry's house and was immediately accosted. A guy wearing a mask held a blade up to the girl's throat, forcing her to take off her clothes and pose for nude pictures. So once he was done, he fled the scene. When Jerry was 17, he asked a girl to go on a drive with him, and she accepted the invite. So Jerry drove this girl to basically the middle of nowhere, close to a farmhouse. He had his blade and threatened the girl that he would hurt her if she didn't remove her clothes. Jerry chased after her and they got into a little tussle. While well, a couple driving nearby saw all of the commotion, pulled over and called the police. They searched his vehicle and found women's underwear and scandalous photographs. Jerry was arrested and charged with assault and battery. Jerry was very honest with the thoughts and fantasies he had. For example, he fantasized about capturing a girl, forcing her to do whatever he wanted, and watching her beg to be let go. Many of his fantasies revolved around the hatred of his mother, Eileen, and wanting power over women. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia and got released after nine months because the doctors considered him no longer a danger to society. He didn't know what his next steps were, so he enlisted in the army at age 20. While in the army, Jerry was referred to an army psychiatrist who discharged him because of his weird obsessions. Once he was released, he was forced to move back in with his parents and live in their back shed. The creepy shenanigans started up again, and this time Jerry would become increasingly more violent with his victims. So Jerry was driving around in his car when he spotted a young woman walking home, 
who he decided to follow. When he saw the coast was clear, he jumped behind her and choked her until she passed out. Then he stole her shoes and made a run for it. The woman reported the incident, but she didn't see his face, so there wasn't much the police could do. Jerry got a job as an electronics technician and worked at a radio station. While there, he met a 17-year-old named Darcy Metzler, and the two started dating. After that, they moved around a lot, as it was difficult for Jerry to keep a job, and Darcy became pregnant. She gave birth to a daughter, and later on, a son. Back at home, things were super weird. Jerry made the basement his dark room to process the creepy photographs he had taken of women and their undergarments. He also wanted Darcy to dress up in the stolen garments and pose naked for photographs. She was not into this, which really upset Jerry. He felt like his wife didn't want to participate in his fantasies, so he needed to fulfill that desire another way. In 1968, his murderous streak would begin. On January 26, 1968, there was a knock at Jerry's front door. Linda Slauson, a 19-year-old girl, was going door-to-door -door selling encyclopedias. Linda followed him down into the basement where, unfortunately, Jerry took a piece of wood, knocked her over the head, and strangled her to death once she was down. This was Jerry's first murder victim. Jerry proceeded to dress Linda up in all the different items he had stolen. He put her in various undergarments and high heels and posed her body for pictures. After doing this, he cut off her left foot as a trophy and placed it in a high heel. He then stored it inside a freezer to preserve it. Jerry managed to sneak the body into his car. He drove to the Willamette River, pretended he had a flat tire, and used that as an excuse to pull over and dump the body. Jerry would not lure another victim to their death until November that same year. Within that time frame, Jerry and his family packed up and moved to Salem. On November 26, 1968, Jerry saw 23-year-old Jan Susan Whitney on the side of the road. Her car had broken down between Salem and Albany. Jerry pulled over and offered help, even offering to give her a ride back to his house to call a tow truck. Jan accepted the offer because she had no other option. They arrived at his home and Jerry proceeded to strangle Jan in the car. Once she was lifeless, he took her body into a secret garage hideout and hung it from a pulley. He dressed her in the stolen underwear and shoes, violated her body and took photographs. After this, he removed one of her breasts, made a mold of it, and painted it gold. Three months later, on March 27, 1969, Jerry found his third victim. A 19-year-old college student named Karen Sprinkler was walking to her car parked outside of a department store. Jerry, dressed in drag, approached Karen from behind and threw her into his vehicle. He restrained her and drove back to his garage. Once inside, he forced her into underwear and took photos of her. He repeatedly assaulted her and tragically strangled her with a pulley until she passed away. Multiple attempted kidnappings during this time were unsuccessful. For example, Jerry tried to abduct a 14-year-old girl named Leanne Brumley, but she escaped. In April of 1969, back-to-back -back kidnappings failed. One, Sharon Wood, a 24-year-old, fled after Jerry approached her with a gun in a parking garage. The next day, Jerry attempted to abduct a 15-year-old girl named Gloria Smith, but thankfully, she also got away. April 23, 1969, Jerry pretended to be a police officer outside a shopping mall. He approached Linda Sally, a 22-year-old, and said she she needed to come with him to the station. She complied because she believed he was who he said he was, and sadly, Jerry would take Linda's life. He violated her body, strangled her, and even electrocuted her. Then, after he was done playing his disgusting game, he tied a car transmission to her body with a nylon cord and threw her body into the river. In May of 1969, a fisherman discovered Linda's body in the Long Tom River. Two days later, Karen's body was found just 50 feet away. The police knew they had a serial killer on their hands. Based on the ages of these women, the police started patrolling the nearby college campus. 
Hundreds of women were questioned by police about a strange man targeting young women. Finally, after tons of interviews, they got a name and description, Jerry Brudos. So the cops start looking through Jerry's file. They saw that Jerry had been arrested on assault charges before. They also found that Jerry was an electrician, which stood out to them. The cord used to tie these women up was all the same kind used by electricians, and one of the bodies had markings attached to electrocution. The police searched Jerry's place and found a myriad of disturbing things. For one, all the photographs of these disturbing crimes, women's shoes and underwear, the wires and tools used to tie his victims. The police were on their way to his house with an arrest warrant, and this guy tried to flee. The authorities caught him and threw him in jail. While there, he tried to convince his wife to burn any evidence, to which she said, absolutely not. Once Jerry was arrested, he came clean on every single homicide and attempted homicide. He was deemed not criminally insane and diagnosed with antisocial personality, manifested by fetishism, transvestitism, exhibitionism, voyeurism, and especially sadism. The judge sentenced Jerry to three consecutive life sentences in Oregon State Penitentiary, and one month after his conviction, Jan Whitney's body was found. Jerry kept tons of women's shoe magazines in his prison cell, as that was his form of sexual entertainment, not regular adult magazines. While he tried to appeal, he was denied and told he would never, ever be released. On March 28, 2006, Jerry died in prison from liver cancer. This one is really intense, but let's get into it. We're gonna talk about a young man who took his fascination with serial killers and true crime stories way too seriously. Someone who went on to commit a truly heinous crime inspired by some of the all-time worst criminals such as Ted Bundy and the Yorkshire Ripper. Young James Fairweather was an average student attending Colchester Academy. He was a happy kid and had good attendance in school. In 2012, as James was starting to get older and about to approach his teenage years, a shift began, and it only escalated with the sudden passing of his grandmother, who he loved dearly. His report cards started to look different. His teachers reported that James was turning into a thug and that his personality had changed. His classmates began to see James as someone who dressed weird and acted weird and was an all-around outsider. Those classmates began to bully James. They would call him names like Dumbo. They would make fun of him for having big ears. In turn, James became more aggressive towards everyone. At one point during the school year, a group of his classmates mugged James and pulled out a blade on him. In his junior year, James told people at school that he had plans to decimate some of his fellow classmates. Some students did not return to school the next day after the claim had been made, but it didn't scare all of the students, so a lot of them did come back. He became fascinated with going on the computer and Google searching and studying true crime and homicide. He enjoyed watching videos of sexual assault victims and some really disturbing pornography. He studied, admired, and became obsessed in particular with Peter Sutcliffe, also known as the Yorkshire Ripper. And of course, Ted Bundy, another one of his favorites. He was infatuated with them. Now, I love true crime cases too, but James Fairweather's love of true crime was not normal. It was very unhealthy. He used these cases and his idols as some sort of a user guide, a how-to guide for revenge and assassination. It started back in 2014 when Fairweather took a blade from the kitchen of his parents' home in Colchester. He slinked out of the house and made his way down to a local neighborhood shop. Using his blade as a weapon, he robbed the shop. He took cigars, cash, and some other random sh but James got caught for his crime. He was sentenced to 12 months of youth supervision. But right after he received this sentence, on March 29, 2014, Fairweather snuck out of the second story window of his parents' house and went on prowl looking for someone or something to destroy. 
He walked around his neighborhood for a bit, but was unsuccessful in finding a victim. So he broadened his search and went walking through Castle Park. That's when he stumbled upon James Atfield, a drunk man who was fast asleep on the walkway of this beautiful park. James was hanging out at his local pub earlier and had one or five too many. He started his adventure home when he thought it'd be best to take a nap in the park and sleep off some of the buzz. Fairweather had found an easy target, a totally innocent person who couldn't defend themselves because they were asleep. Fairweather took his blade and punctured the man in the abdomen. Atfield woke up from the attack and tried to defend himself the best he could. Fairweather then had to become more aggressive and accomplish his task. James recalls the attack saying he screamed loudly, the sort of scream that goes right through you. James punctured the man in the torso many times. More than a hundred puncture wounds were discovered on James Atfield's body. Fairweather also jabbed Atfield through the eye. And I hate to say this, but these cuts were not careless or chaotic or wild, but actually showed that Fairweather had a technique, similar to the technique of the monsters Fairweather admired, such as the Yorkshire Ripper. James has said that during the attack on James Atfield, quote, my voices were laughing and laughing louder and louder. Fairweather told police both murder weapons had been thrown in a river. It wasn't until hours later that James Atfield's body was found. It was around 5.45 a.m. that a nearby walker uncovered the horrific scene and called the authorities. Unfortunately, by the time the authorities showed up, James Atfield had passed. The officer who responded to the call recounts the scene. I saw something lying on the ground. I sprinted towards the object on the floor, which was clearly a body covered in blood. The body was lying face up. At this point, I donned my blue gloves. He said, I quickly checked on the state of the body, which had a large amount of wounds and a huge amount of blood underneath him. There were lacerations to his head, hands, and face, and a huge amount of blood congealed around his left eye. I couldn't see the eye at all. Fairweather was nowhere in sight. After Fairweather put an end to James Atfield's life, he went back home. He took off his clothes that were drenched in Atfield's body fluid, and he threw the soiled clothes into a trash bag and disposed of the evidence in a trash bin that was designated for dog poop. Fast forward to three months later, June 17, 2014, Fairweather struck again. This time, he didn't wait for nighttime. This time, he pounced on his target in broad daylight. He's getting bolder with his pursuit, cocky even. This time, his victim was 31-year-old Nahid Almanea. Nahid was from Saudi Arabia, but moved to the United Kingdom just six months prior to study the English language program at the International Academy. Nahid was a great student, very smart and well-liked by her other classmates, as well as by her teachers, the complete opposite of James Fairweather. Not that James knew any of this. Nahid was just a random target. He had no connection to her. The encounter between Nahid Almanea and James Fairweather on June 17, 2014, took place at the Salary Brook Trails off of Avon Way. This is the path that Nahid would take to and from her classes on campus. She walked that trail almost every day. She usually would walk this path with her brother, but unfortunately on that day, Nahid was alone. Fairweather was lurking around in the bushes. Nahid was solo, casually walking the trails. Then Fairweather snuck up behind her and hit her. She stumbled to the ground. Fairweather then used a weapon to slash Nahid 16 times. She passed instantly. Once he was done with Nahid, he chucked his weapon into the nearby river, disposing of the evidence. James once again took off his dirty clothes, dripping in red, and put them into the trash. James Atfield and Nahid Almanea's bodies were found only two miles apart, and the crimes took place just a couple of months apart. But even with this information, the police had nothing to connect these two crimes. At first, they thought they were unrelated crimes. No leads came in, and there were no real people of interest at the time. A 10,000 pound reward for anyone coming forward with information about the person who committed these crimes was offered, but no one ever came forward with tips or clues. There were multiple composite sketches of who the authorities might be looking for that were released to the public, but none of them actually looked anything like our guy James Fairweather. 
Fairweather seemed to have gotten away with both of these heinous crimes until May 26th, 2015, a whole year later. It was around 11 a.m. that Fairweather was back on Salary Brook trails and in search of another victim. He was back in the bushes, just a few feet away from where Nahid had passed. A woman walking the trail noticed Fairweather and had a gut reaction. She saw him, stopped her route, turned around, and started walking back in the direction she just came from because she was picking up on his vibe. She made a call to the police stating that there was a strange young man stalking around in the bushes and acting suspicious. She also found it odd that he was walking in the dog section of the park, but he didn't have a dog with him. She recounts that day at the park saying, he was no more than 15 feet away and staring straight at me. It's a face that will never leave me, a manic look. Back to the story. Police arrived on the scene to find 16-year-old James Fairweather trying to flee, but they stopped him. He said he was just out for a walk to clear his head and that he didn't feel right. The police asked him to take his hands out of his pockets and he complied, revealing he was wearing rubber gloves and carrying a lock knife. He was then taken into custody. That evening, he confessed to both crimes. He said he had found James Atfield asleep the night the voices in his head were telling him he needed to make the sacrifice and execute James, and that James was the chosen one. The voices said if Fairweather didn't go through with these actions, the voices would come after Fairweather himself. He said the voices were laughing at him louder and louder. He told them that Nahid had brought this act upon herself since she was walking the trails alone. Fairweather was on a roll. He even admitted to police that he was on the hunt for his next victim when they found him over at Salary Brook Trails. And for the cherry on top, he added that if he was jailed and was able to make bail and let out, he would again take the lives of innocent people. However, in January 2016, he retracted his statement. He denied having anything to do with Nahid or James. He denied being in possession of an offensive weapon, but admitted to two alternative counts of manslaughter by reason of diminished responsibility. The Crown Prosecution Service did not want to take the plea deal. They decided to move forward and pursue the charges. Fairweather was now facing a double homicide trial. The trial took place in April of 2016. Fairweather continued his story of hearing voices in his head telling him to do it and make the sacrifice. He told those evaluating and questioning him that he was possessed by the devil. The courts, however, rejected this notion. It was revealed at the trial that he was diagnosed with Asperger's and autism and that he had started hearing voices in his head as early as age 11. Dr. Joseph was brought into the trial as a prosecution witness. Dr. Joseph agreed with the Asperger's and autism diagnosis, but he called BS on Fairweather's supposed visual and auditory hallucinations. He said they were totally fabricated. And Dr. Joseph said that James was just making it up in an attempt to deceive the authorities. He was using the hallucinations to distance himself from the reality of what he had done. We know that Fairweather was obsessed and studied all those horrible criminals, and his internet search history can prove that. Talk to any of his teachers. Talk to any of his schoolmates. It was brought to the attention of the court that Fairweather revealed to the doctors evaluating him for this case that he had intentions of executing at least 15 more people, but didn't because he got caught. So this feels like a no-brainer. James Fairweather needs to go to jail. The jury for this case took eight plus hours to reach a final decision, but eventually they found him guilty of both murders. He was sentenced to 27 years in prison without the possibility of parole. And in true James Fairweather fashion, he reacted to the verdict by giving a thumbs up, and then he looked over to his parents and mouthed the words, I don't give a Talk about no remorse for your actions. So disrespectful. What do you guys think? Is James Fairweather the worst criminal we've ever covered? Do you believe he was hearing voices in his head leading him to commit these vicious acts? Was it really his grandmother's death that sent him over the edge or was he just a ticking time bomb? I wanna hear all about it, so please let us know in the comments below. I'm Brandy, this has been Killer Bites. Stay safe out there and be wary of people at dog parks that are there without a dog. See ya.
Welcome back to Killer Bites. Thanks for joining me for another episode of True Crime. Today I'm going to cover American serial killer Tommy Lynn Sells, the man responsible for taking the lives of at least 22 people. This is also the story of Crystal Searles, a brave and determined 10-year-old, but I don't want to give away anything just yet. If you're ready to hear more about this case, keep on watching. On June 28, 1964 in Oakland, California, Tommy Lynn Sells and his twin sister Tammy Jean Sells were born. After only a year and a half, Tammy Jean died. The two had become sick with meningitis, but Tommy was the only one to survive. Once Tammy had passed away, Tommy's mother asked her sister Bonnie to take care of him. She was going through a difficult period of grief after losing her daughter and needed time to heal. Bonnie lived in Holcomb, Missouri and grew very fond of Tommy. She felt like a mother figure to him and she told Tommy that she had plans of adopting him. She was his main caretaker until he was five years old. Once Tommy's mother heard of Bonnie's plans to adopt her son, she felt the urge to take him back home. Shortly after, she brought him back to live with her and his other older siblings. Tommy's early life was chaotic. When he was just seven years old, he started to use alcohol as a coping mechanism for his unstable home life. At eight years old, Tommy started spending time with an older man named Willis Clark. According to Tommy, his mother had no issue with Willis taking advantage of and molesting him, even encouraging the abuse. When Tommy was only 10 years old, he stopped going to school. Instead, he spent most of his time partaking in drugs and alcohol, and his life began to take a heavy downward turn. There was an incident a few years later when he was 13 years old where he took off all of his clothes and hopped into his grandmother's bed while she slept. He wanted to achieve some sort of sexual gratification. After Tommy's out-of-control behavior, he was kicked out of the house and banned from ever returning. Shortly after, Tommy's mother and his own siblings up and left town without warning, leaving Tommy homeless and responsible for fending for himself. For the next 20 years, Tommy was essentially on his own. He found ways to support with small gigs here and there, but he never kept a job for very long. He spent most of his adult life until that point hopping from town to town and never stayed in one area longer than he had to. He would jump onto trains or hitch rides with random people who saw him standing on the side of the road. And along the way, he would commit many crimes and was thrown in jail multiple times. Tommy claims to have committed his first murder when he was just 16 years old. After breaking into a home, he witnessed an older man taking advantage of a young boy. He claimed to have pulled out a gun and shot the man on sight. However, this is still unconfirmed. In May of 1981, Tommy met up with the family who abandoned him. He traveled down to Little Rock, Arkansas, but wasn't allowed to stay in the home very long. He took off his clothes and attempted to walk into the shower that his mother was using, again, as a way to find some sick sexual satisfaction. She kicked him out of the house and again, he was banned from returning. Although he did try to seek treatment, it didn't work and it wasn't to the level he needed. His behavior became out of control. While working at a carnival in 1985, Tommy met a 28-year-old woman named Ina and her four-year-old son, Rory. The woman and Tommy hit it off and after some flirty conversation, she invited him to come and stay at her place for the evening. The two slept together, and according to Tommy, after they were done, she started to snoop through his bag, attempting to steal from him. Tommy snuck into her son's room, grabbed a baseball bat, and beat Ina and her son to death. A few days later, both Ina and Rory's bodies were found, but by the time they were discovered, Tommy was nowhere to be found. He had hopped on a train and fled to another state. In 1987, Tommy drugged and strangled a woman named Stephanie. He proceeded to dump her body into a hot spring located in the desert after encasing her feet in concrete. I mean, that's some, that's some mob stuff right there. While in New York, Tommy took the life of a 27-year-old woman named Suzanne. Then, while hitchhiking throughout Illinois, Tommy was picked up by a man named Keith Dardine. Keith invited Tommy back to his house to share dinner with the family as he could see that Tommy was in need of food and company. As soon as they walked through the door, Tommy pulled out a gun, shooting Keith in the head twice. He then proceeded to castrate him and shot him once more. Peter, Keith's son, saw what happened. And sadly, Tommy took a baseball bat and beat him to death. He turned to Keith's pregnant wife, Elaine, and attacked her. And the beating caused her to go into labor. The child was born prematurely, and Tommy beat the newborn child as well. He then took advantage of Elaine, mutilated her, took advantage of her unalive body and fled the scene. I apologize if that was graphic. It was really hard to describe, but this man was pure evil. His intention was to kill them because he wanted a thrill. He found pleasure in seeing other people suffer, a truly disgusting individual. In 1990, Tommy was sentenced to 16 months in jail for stealing a car in Wyoming. While there, he received a diagnosis of antisocial, borderline personality disorder, as well as bipolar disorder, psychosis, and major depressive disorder. 
He was untreated and unmedicated, but spent most of his days drinking or taking drugs to numb his mental and emotional pain. Shortly after his release, he traveled to West Virginia and stood on the street corner with a sign asking for change in food. In 1992, a young 19-year-old woman named Fabienne, out of the kindness of her heart, picked him up and drove him to her house to feed him. He stayed in her car while she ran inside. Of course, Tommy had other ideas on his mind and stormed inside her house. He grabbed a knife, held her hostage, and tried to take advantage of her sexually. Fabienne fought for her life. She grabbed a ceramic decorative duck and repeatedly smashed it into his head. Somehow, she managed to take the knife from Tommy and sliced his kidney, liver, and one of his testicles. Full of rage, Tommy took a stool and beat her over the head. She was left with a major gash on her head, but thankfully survived after surgery. As for Tommy, he landed in the emergency room because of his wounds. He was charged and served five years in prison for his crimes. Yet again, another person who just wanted to help. Tommy didn't know how to accept love, much less show it to other people. Surprisingly enough though, Tommy found love while in prison. He married a woman named Nora Price, and after he was released in 1997, he traveled to Tennessee to live with her. I assume that leading a normal, non-violent life was too boring for Tommy, and he quickly became bored. As soon as the two moved in together, Tommy left and continued traveling. Shortly after leaving his wife, Nora, Tommy went back to his life of violent crime. On October 13th, 1997, while traveling through Illinois, he killed a 10-year-old boy named Joel, and Joel's own mother was actually convicted of his murder. He quickly made his way out of Illinois and into Missouri. And just two days after killing Joel, Tommy found a 13-year-old girl named Stephanie Mahaney and killed her, close to Springfield. He proceeded to take the lives of two other people in the following two years. One, a nine-year-old child named Mary Beatrice Perez. The other was a 14-year-old child named Haley McCone, who he also assaulted before murdering her. The final crime of our story today involves 13-year-old Katie Harris, 10-year-old Crystal Searles, and seven-year-old Mark Searles. On New Year's Eve night, 1999, in Del Rio, Texas, Crystal and Mark showed up at Katie Harris's house for a sleepover. Crystal and Mark's parents were traveling through Kansas, and instead of staying at the house alone, they thought a sleepover would be fun and safe. That night, Mark was told to sleep in the room with a single bed, while Crystal and Katie shared a room with a bunk bed. Mark was furious. She felt like the annoying younger sibling left out of all the fun New Year's Eve celebrations. After the hype died down, everyone went to sleep. Just then, at around 3.50 a.m., Crystal woke up in the top bunk to the sound of a scream. She saw a man with long, dark, scruffy hair and a long, bushy beard standing at the end of her bed. Tommy Lynn Sells had broken into Katie Harris's home, walked into her room, and began attacking her. While she did fight back, she was overpowered by the grown man and his knife, and she was stabbed over 16 times. Tommy hadn't realized that Crystal was sleeping in the top bunk. Just as he went to turn off the lights, he turned around and saw 10-year-old Crystal staring back at him. He rushed over to the top bunk and slit her throat. He proceeded to turn off the lights and close the door behind him. Crystal climbed down to Katie, who was gasping for air. Crystal tried to speak, but she couldn't due to her throat injury. And she believed that the man had gone after everyone in the house and she needed to get help immediately. It was truly a life or death situation. Crystal, hands around her throat, walked over a quarter mile to the closest house. She banged on the door, unable to speak, but could write notes. The police made it to the house and Crystal continued to speak to them through her notepad, begging them to hurry and save the Harris family. Sadly, Katie didn't survive because her wounds were too severe. They rushed her to the hospital and despite having a sliced trachea, Crystal survived. Over a few days, she managed to work with the police and sketch artists. And within days, Tommy had been arrested and charged for his murder of Katie and attempted murder of Crystal. During the trial, Crystal took the stand and testified against Tommy. Can you believe a child as young as she was was brave enough to face him again? He was found guilty and sentenced to death. This is where he confessed to many of the other crimes he committed, explaining that he had harmed over 70 people. In April of 2014, Tommy died by lethal injection in Texas. The Harris family, the Perez family, and Crystal Searles all attended. That is the end of our story. And what did you all think of this one? I can't believe that it took so long to finally put this man behind bars, but because of Crystal's fight to stay alive and her bravery to testify against him, he finally lost. Thank you all so much for watching this episode. And if you want to watch some more, feel free to check out the Killer Bites page. Until next time, see you later.